Lydia Caccio dook onder in de duistere wereld van de internationale vrouwenhandel en kindslavernij. Ze sprak er met ronselaars en slachtoffers en schreef daar een boek over. Sindsdien is ze haar leven niet meer zeker en kan niet meer zonder beveiliging over straat. Wat is er mis met de macht van mannen? En wat heeft het feminisme te maken met de seksindustrie? De komende 25 minuten spreek ik met de Mexicaanse journalist en activist Lydia Cacho. Welkom, Mrs. Cacho. Goed te hebben. Je Your boek is called Slaves of Power. Who are the slaves and who's got the power? Well, the, there are slaves around the world, and women, men, and children. But specifically, I, I centered on the women and children around the world. Mm -hmm. So for five years, I went around different countries to study the, um, the sex slavery within the uh, sex industry around the world and how it affects them, their human rights and their life of them in the countries they are at and of their families yeah. uh, from the countries they left. And if we're talking about uh, sex slavery and the human trafficking that's involved with it worldwide, what, what figures are we talking about? Well, there is uh, what the UN calls the dance of figures. Sometimes mm. uh, I tend to use the, the lower uh, numbers because as a journalist, what I believe in is not to, um, to scare people with numbers, but to tell people these are uh, real human beings that are going through this, su this suffering. The UN says that 1.4 uh, million people are enslaved every year, are victims of trafficking. Mm. But now we have the Department of State of the United States of America saying in the last tip report that almost 25 million people are within uh, the world in uh, um, suffering of slavery in different ways of mm. uh, labor and sexual and other types of uh, slavery like domestic uh, slavery and, and yeah. um, marriages forced marriages yeah. but so at least uh, on a yearly basis 1.4 exactly. million women and children conservative estimate um, how did you go about finding out what's going on in that in that world it seems like a dangerous job to me well it is it is a dangerous job but somebody has to do it and i'm an investigative reporter i've been there i started working as a reporter 23 years ago in mexico and uh, what i did was um, six or seven years ago i i started making a map of the mafias that are buying and selling women around the world. Mm -hmm. And I found some um, tips of uh, like the Japanese mafia working in Mexico in, in the northern state of Tijuana in Mexico, the Yakuza. I found the cell of the Yakuza in Mexico. And uh, I started investigating them and I saw that not only they, they chose Mexican women, girls, especially teenage girls, to to take them to other countries, but they also deal with drugs. So I wanted to follow the paths mm. and understand the pattern, international pattern of organized crime around the world. And I found out that some of these organized crime gangs around the world, Mexican included, of course, are not only selling drugs, but they, they found out in the last 10 years, and specifically in the last five years, that it is faster and easier and cheaper for them to buy and sell human beings than it is buying and selling guns drugs. and drugs, of course. Mm. Because specifically in Latin America and in other countries where the, there is uh, drug poli policies against drugs and drug trafficking, um, they, are, they were not paying enough attention to the human trafficking. And mm. they, they, it really increased in all over the world. Okay, we, we'll get to that, to, to, to the extensivity mm. of uh, the problem. But um, first, you, so you traveled all around the world, yes. visited many countries. What's, what's the worst country uh, in this respect? I guess the worst country is the country in which one lives. That, that was, should be the focus. Mm. I should worry about what is happening in Mexico and what I can do with my country, fellow women and fellow uh, children. And I think that is the same applies to Holland. But uh, the one that it affected me the most and impressed me the most was Japan. Hmm. First of all, because Japan has been um, like a closed door to the rest of the world in general. We can read a lot about the Yakuza mafias, we can read a lot about the geisha culture, but we don't really know about what's going on in Japan. What impressed me the most was is this incredible power the Yakuza has within the political system and the business um, uh, system in, the, in, in and, Japan. And, and I, I read about Japan in your book, and what was interesting about it, one, one has 
the idea that in this trade it's mostly uh, poor women and children from underdeveloped countries. But you tell a story about an American girl that was kidnapped or, or used by the Yakuza in Japan. Yes, the first thing that we have to, to think about when we talk about trafficking is uh, just get rid of all the cliches. It's not only African girls being exploited in Holland, it's uh, Dutch women being exploited in Holland and Turkish and probably Latin American, etc. So in, in Japan what happens is not only Colombian women, I interview Colombian young women in, in Japan that have been trapped, hmm. Mexican, American, uh, of course Japanese teenagers, but the thing with them, with the Japan that amazed me the most is how the culture of the mafias and a link with the police and some part of society that is denying the issue are creating this uh, glamorization of, of teenage and child prostitution. Hmm. That is what I think is most scary. In a country that we tend to believe it's very uh, high in progress and educated, it's, uh, it, there is this um, incredible misogyny and sexism within the Japanese culture that we have to look at. Yeah. And how much of an exception is Japan in that respect? I don't think it's a big exception. I think what I what I think is that um, um, Japan um, it's very similar in some ways to countries like Brazil or Mexico in which um, there is this culture of um, exploiting children and teenage girls and boys within the system of prostitution within the industry and people are not paying enough attention mm -hmm. that sense but Japan announces it what is amazing is that you go, go through the red light districts in Japan which are not called red light district of course the nightclub did districts. you go there I went there I took pictures, I, I walk around, I went into the places, I dress up in different places uh, as a prostitute or as a nun, depending on what I needed so to go. So give me this one image that, that <laughs> stuck to you. Uh, in Japan, for example, I went into this bar with the help of two Japanese journalists. Mm. They went with me, two female journalists. We went into this um, uh, some, like very nice bar where teenage boys are um, company boys to women, uh, to tourist women. And so I went in and they're supposed to accompany you while you have drinks and they're very, they all look alike. They look like, they have this emo look that looks very uh, sharp and handsome, thin, uh, boy looking like 16, 17, 18 mm. and then uh, at the end I, I of course I asked one of the kids if they could go with me to the hotel at the beginning they had this thing they said no but at the end he said okay I'll accompany to the hotel I'll accompany to you to the hotel once we woke out he started telling me how much he would charge to have sex with me mm. these are teenage boys mm. and this is happening uh, very easily I'm Mexican I don't speak Japanese I talked in English with him and he had perfect English and he was trained to do that and he's paid by the groups of the Yakuza. So it's a very accessible industry. Absolutely accessible. Yeah. It's yeah. nothing, it's not hidden anywhere, it's just right there. And it's the same thing for men, of course, that they can go into this geisha bar. Yeah. Uh, they, they have this culture of the comfort women that if you're a tourist you go to any, you know, any nice hotel in Japan and you call a comfort woman. Uh, the, good hotels, uh, good five hotels. star hotels. Absolutely, and mm. they will send you a comfort mm. woman, yeah. which means it's someone to be with you. Now, one of one of the reasons you wrote the book, and one of the central theses, is that that uh, trafficking, sex trafficking, has never been as extensive as it is in the history of the world. Um, how come? I think it has a lot to do with the things we haven't seen. Uh, through the discussion of the last 20 years regarding prostitution. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, all countries, the ones that have legalized prostitutions, uh, prostitution and the ones that haven't, we keep discussing with society the fact of uh, prostitution as, as if it was taken in an isolated area, as we do it physically, we put them in a red light district. Mm. And we discuss it, we as, if it didn't, yes. <laughs> know, as if it didn't belong to, to social rules. You know, mm. and, and prostitution is one of the ways in which the sex industry works. It's a market of human beings selling human beings and selling sex in a dehumanized way. And I'm not moralizing about this. I think sex is wonderful and the erotic life of everyone should be free. What I'm saying is the sex industry is promoting very a lot of violence within the pornography, for example, mm -hmm. and that the por uh, pornography around the world has changed incredibly, and it's interlinked with pornography. Yeah. With but you also link it in your book to globalization. Absolutely, absolutely, it has a lot to do with it because um, when the Americans are the greatest producers of, uh, of pornography, 
mm. in the world. And when, when the um, Iron Curtain came down, the Russians started producing pornography really cheap, and they trashed the, the American market in many ways. So what, ha what is happening is now the, the real pornography that is making money around the world is teenage and child pornography. Mm. And you can talk to any police, like the cyber police in Holland, and they will tell you they yes, have a huge, our experiences a recently, really yes. bad time. Mm. Mm. Uh, because they find five pages and then there's ten more next day. So child pornography and teenage pornography is increasing. And the sex industry is selling children younger and younger. And also the market is changing because the clients of prostitution around the world are looking for teenage girls oh. or boys, if, if it's the case, given the case. There's another link you make in the book, which I found very surprising, and that's the link between feminism and the sex industry. How does this work? Well, I, I found this, I'm a feminist myself, and mm. I found this, um, I think there's like a backlash of feminism right now in many countries. We can see it in Mexico, we can see it in Spain, I think we can see it in a different way in Holland, but we can certainly see it in, in Sweden, for backlash example. Backlash in, in the male the reaction backlash, to backlash, which means that the feminists gain all this, all this, all this um, uh, rights of women and, and the right to be in certain places. Mm. And all of a sudden, we didn't um, impact, truly impact the men in the world. Mm. Some men individually changed their view of women, which is great. But the men didn't act as a collective group to impact on the other men that still are very sexist and very misogynist. So, so, so violence so against women uh, did increase because increasing. of this reaction? Absolutely. I will mm. give you a very quick example in Spain. The laws are incredible for women. Women have gained a lot. Mm. And all of a sudden, assass femicides or assassination of women are increasingly, increasing incredibly, and the government doesn't know what to do. It's the husband and ex-husbands that are killing the wife because they are going to the, law, to mm. the judges to get a divorce. Yeah. So it's, it's all these millions of men that never agree. It wasn't feminism didn't push a social pact between men and women. Mm. It's just women gain uh, uh, the right rights, our rights, and all of a sudden these men are just coming back yeah. with a vengeance But there's, 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 there's an even more astonishable link that you describe. You say that uh, the feminist idea of liberation, sexual liberation of women is in fact promoting prostitution. How does in some that work? Cases, in some cases I find that. I have really good friends or teachers of feminism that I admire around the world that I interviewed regarding prostitution. And what they say, they are uh, arguing that um, it's just a way of working. You know, it's mm. like one of them an uh, answers something very, very strange to me. She said, some women work with their hands, some women work with, the, with their brains, and some women, women work with their vaginas. And I thought, this is, this is absurd because it's not like a part of your body can separate from the rest of your body, from your emotion, from your integrity, and, and prostitution has a lot of violence within it. Uh, I interview hundreds of prostitutes around the world, of, and women and girls that are trafficked. And I can tell you for sure, I mean, it's not my imagination, it's what they say. Most of them um, have been living different kinds of violence, and, and the ones that have normalized violence mm. live violence since they were children. So, they so you think there's it. no such thing as a woman that chooses for prostitution and does it from free will and sees it as a job? I, I do think there are, absolutely. I, but I think it's like one or two percent around the world. Yeah. These women that are very, um, that have, have, are in a protected environment in such a way that they really decide, can decide to go in and out of this situation, that they decide if they want to be with certain clients or not, and they, they set the rules. But from the two percent around the world, 90 percent are, are being slaved. Mm. And then that's when you decide that what is better for society, if you save the 2%, you know, or, or rescue the 98%. Okay. What, I'm, what I'm saying is we have to look at the other yeah. percentage. What you're also saying is that this madness, you say, of sex trafficking, sex industry, could not go on without the complicity of state and society. What exactly is the complicity of the state? And does it go for all states in the world? Uh, absolutely. It goes for all states. I, I, I know that some countries are more corrupted than others. So there's uh, corrupted politicians and immigration agents and policemen everywhere around the world. Some countries have very little. Some countries have... Uh, 
the huge amounts of corrupted uh, civil servants. But it, it couldn't happen. I will give you a quick example of mm. Holland. You had uh, recently you had this famous case of the two Nigerian men that um, brought 115. Uh, women from uh, Nigeria to be, uh, that is trafficking, right, to, mm. as victims of trafficking and they, the, to, for prostitution. Um, and uh, some of, uh, of this couldn't have happened without the complicity of certain civil servants. No way two guys could bring 115 women at the same time, right? So it happened. And when so you're saying we do have corrupt officials at Schiphol yes, Airport everywhere. or whatever? Everywhere. There's pro Holland. probably a couple. And that doesn't explain it. But what explains it is, is for example, you have one mayor that decides to, to make the red light district in, in Amsterdam smaller, right? Yes. And he, he told the people of Amsterdam, OK, don't worry about it. I'm not going to disappear prostitution. I'm just going to take it away from schools. And my question would be, if it's legal, if it's all right, if it's so modern, why would you keep it away from children? You know, if it's so natural to mm. you. So there's this double standard all the time with which we are playing and politicians are playing around the world. It's the same with the Turkish government that has these brothels that the Turkish government runs itself. They get all the money from them, but they also have these special brothels that are like high class brothels with women from outside. And it's the government who's running it. Mm. Same thing in Mexico. You know, prostitution is illegal, but we have red light districts that are operated by the system because they think that that it's all right to have them, mm. but it's immoral to have them near the good people. Mm. So it's very racist, it's very sexist, but we still allow it and nobody questions that discourse, you know? The other thing uh, about fighting prostitution is uh, the question of legalization. Uh, in Holland, it is legal because in Holland, uh, the authorities think that we can protect the girls better and we can give them better circumstances and we can control the industry so it will not go underground. You seem to disagree in your book. Absolutely. I, Why? I find it I find it very disturbing to to think that a government would think, okay, there's a group, a social group it's called women, that we will um, allow to be ex sexually exploited and treated as subjects, right, by society, because we believe uh, even though we don't say it, that men as a social group cannot control their sexuality, right? So we have to give them something and we have to have them in a ghetto in which men can come and pay for sex with no intimacy, with no responsibility, they can be violent, they can do whatever because it's their business, right? But then again, if it was so normal, why wouldn't it be the same thing like red light districts of men? If women and men have exactly the same desires. Maybe there's no demand. <laughs> exactly. Because culture has created this disparity between men and women, saying that men are really sexual and eroticized and women are not. Which but as is long as the demand is there, you also say, there will be prostitution. Now, yeah. the demand will not disappear overnight. overnight so no. in the meantime, wouldn't it be better to control it and have it in a legal frame? I think that what it would be better is to change the discourse. Instead of saying, okay, this is prostitution and this is what it is, we have to look at it in a broader way and see what the sex industry is doing in our community, in our society, in our country, especially, for example, in, in Holland, speaking here, is what, the, what is the prostitution linked to here? Mm. How many pimps are there? How, how much violence do you, they really live, even though we're supposed to protect their human rights, right? And then um, how much money comes through the legal system and how much money goes through the illegal system and through the money laundering. And then how is uh, pornography linked to this industry? And you have to look at what prostitution is doing to the teenage girls in Holland. Mm. This is really important because there is this culture. A few days ago, I was talking to this mother of a of Dutch girl, 15-year-old, that I, she asked her, Mom, why is my boyfriend, a very nice boy, asking me to have my genitals shaved? And he said that my genitals are not beautiful. And I asked why, and she showed me um, pornography on the internet where all the mm. women have uh, vaginoplasties, where they are shaved. And these kids are learning uh, what erotic, eroticism and sex, sex is in the internet with pornography. Okay. And this is a subproduct of, of, of prostitution. We cannot separate it. No. We, 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 we know that discussion in Holland. But, but uh, still, 
Um, if we abolish prostitution, the demand will not disappear. Some people would argue that the number of rapes will go sky high when there's no prostitution. I know. Can, I mean, if I were a man, I would feel really insulted by that. See? I mean, I know there are men that commit crimes as, such as rape, of course. But saying that most men that pay for sex with prostitutes would become rapists because they don't have control over their sexuality. Maybe not most, but... But a lot of them, do you think so? And then I don't know. If, if, listen to me, if that would be the truth, if that would be a hypothesis, then it means that they exercise violence with prostitutes. Mm. Why would you have prostitutes in a ghetto with men that would be able to become rapists if they didn't have that? Mm. Because they are raping prostitutes. So we are saying it is okay to have ghettos of women that are being raped every day by these men that we control. Mm. And it's a controlled market of humans, which I find absurd. And I, I, I see an example that is working. We haven't seen enough proof, but I think we've seen a little proof. Which it's is? Sweden. Hmm. The Swedish model. Where I went twice. Are prosecuted. Yeah. I went twice to Stockholm. I talked to some of the women that were in prostitution and now have other options, and they're really happy with it. Except for one woman from Africa that was really angry that she was taking, a, you know, the, the, her clients were being taken away. The rest of them were ecstatic that they had other choices, real chances and possibilities of doing something else with their life. Mm. So what does that so tell you? So the prosecution you? of clients is a it's key possible. factor, you of think? Of course, because we are, this, the, this message they are sending to, to men that are clients or potential clients are, okay, listen, you guys, there's a whole world full of men and women, half of them half, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have to learn new ways to relate to women inequality, new ways to understand how to build intimacy with women. I'm not only, I'm not talking about love, but erotic intimacy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To establish this. Mm -hmm. We have millions of women around the world that want to have sex, and they can't because they don't find men to have sex with. This is absurd, but it's true. Mm -hmm. So what's happening with this man? We have to teach men. Men have to learn oh, so how that, to establish it. Is that, is that it. number one on your priority I list? I think it is. We mm -hmm. have to teach kids, boys, little boys. Feminism did a great job with girls. We taught them they have rights. They have to, the right to appropriate their own body and their sexuality and their erotic life. Now it's the turn to teach the boys to be better human beings, not to be rapists, to teach them how to get into equal relationship with women. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we should focus on instead of saying this is a moral panic if issue and we should you know, keep the women in the ghetto. It's just destroy the ghettos and change your view, social view through education and public policies regarding equality and the relationship between men and women mm -hmm. and have a really good sex education that includes how to build intimacy, how to build an erotic discourse that has no violence in it. Because it's like we just settle for the worst. It's like we're settling. I mean, I, I'm happily mar married. I've been involved with men that are really nice that would never hurt a woman. So why not? Mm. Why can this man be an example to the rest of the man? Let's end this in conversation in a hopeful note. What's, what's the yes. most hopeful story in your book? I think it is uh, all the women that have gone through hell and back from trafficking. Most of them are learning the lesson and they are teaching other girls and women not to get into trafficking. They are t giving them tools to learn on one hand. And the other thing that is amazing, it's all the men that are all going all through the world learning about trafficking and understanding that they have to stop it themselves not only by rescuing the woman but by rescuing the men that are not seeing the harm they are causing to women around the world yeah and about yourself how hopeful is your situation because you were in big trouble because of your last book which was yeah. about child pornography how's your security situation at the moment yeah well i i just recently a month ago got a really bad death threat and yeah of course uh, one of the leaders of one of this child pornography gang was sentenced uh, a couple of weeks ago for 112 years of jail for child pornography which is a historical sentence in mexico and he said he's gonna kill me because he got a sentence so um, it's quite unsafe, but I, I take uh, So can you walk the street in Mexico? Not easily, but I do. I do have a lot of, uh, take a lot of uh, security mesh, um, you know, um, actions all the time and my family too, but I think that it has to be done. It's effective, you know, it's working. So that's why they're angry. Okay. 
Lydia Caccio, thank you very much for this conversation. Dit was Gesprek op 2 voor deze zondag. Volgende week is er weer een Gesprek op 2, dan met Daphne Bunskoek. Bedankt voor nu en hopelijk tot dan.